Hi, my name is Nancy Fudge, and I am here with Sandra Schlachtmeier. And one moment. Okay. okay. Sandra Schlachtmeier has an undergraduate degree from Wisconsin in education. Uh, and she taught high school and English. Uh, she has a graduate degree from Northwestern University. She has a master's in journalism. She spent her business life working with words in advertising, public relations, newsletters. She is now working with words as a volunteer at the National Museum of Natural History of, of the Smithsonian Institution. She spent 25 years helping write and edit reports for Dr. Douglas Owsley uh, in physical anthropology. He and his staff have examined the remains of the Manassas Civil War battlefield, Colonial Jamestown, and the 9,000-year-old Kennewick Man. She has helped write and edit information for those and many other pro articles for the Journal of Anthropology. Um, her book, A Death Decoded, is one of these investigations. Dr. Owsley, or Dr. Sorry, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Ow Owsley examined the skeleton of Robert Kennicott, uh, the, the sci a scientist from Chicago um, who, who studied at the Smithsonian. Kennicott died in Alaska while on a specimen gathering expedition for the Smithsonian, and it was thought he committed suicide. The skeletal proof was missing. So Dr. So Dr. Owsley asked uh, Sandra if she would um, research Kennecott's last days for for evidence. And this is how she became involved in the same expedition that Rothrock joined uh, and the set the topic of this research. She is the foremost expert in. Uh, at the, uh, on the Smithsonian and Western Union Telegraph Expedition to Alaska in the 1860s. She spent 25 years, uh, well, she has 25 years experience writing and researching in physical anthropology. Uh, she has, she is um, the personal and writer and ele uh, editor of uh, the physical anthropologist, uh, Dr. Douglas Owsley. Uh, she spent 10 years researching Kennecott and the Alaskan expedition. She is, she is a current Smithsonian writer and researcher and the author of the book, Death Decoded Robert Kennecott and the Alaskan Telegraph. Welcome, welcome, Sandra Schlachtmeier. And I love your name. I think it's a beautiful <laughs> German name. Um, Great German name. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. I'm so grateful to have you. And I know I just talked about all the things that make you an expert in this field, but can you tell me your expertise and share with us a little bit about who you are? Well, thank you for having me because I'm delighted to talk about the Western Union Expedition. So few people know about it that uh, conversation gets a little slow. Um, You've listed most of the things that I have uh, ever done, um, but I have to say that volunteering at the Smithsonian has been the most fun ever, ever. I mean, can you imagine standing there at Kennecott's casket and helping to evaluate what they were looking at? I was taking notes during that whole time, and it was days worth that the scientists went through bit by bit. Um, and Owsley has let me come to other digs that he has done. We've been right there at the gravesides, bringing the bones up, cleaning them off, putting them in special cases. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, and when I went to volunteer for this, the woman at the Smithsonian said, well, but there will be bones. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So that's how come I got into this whole thing with the Western Union. And I have to say, remember, I concentrated on Kennecott. So what I know about Rothrock is not maybe quite so much as you do, but I do know about the Western Union expedition and how it worked and how he got involved in that. So um, the whole notion of 
Kennecott was really, oh, and the Western Union Expedition. Have you got that logo? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Um, and it shows essentially what Western Union hoped to do. And the focus for Western Union always, always was on the economics of it, the commercial aspect of it. They were in this to accomplish getting the telegraph across the world, across the globe, from Alaska into the uh, area of Siberia. And they were doing it not out of the goodness of their heart, but because the Atlantic telegraph had been attempted and they were going to, um, Cyrus Field was going to lay his cable across under the ocean. And everybody said, oh my God, that's ridiculous. It's much better if you go on land. So Western Union said, right, we can make it better, faster than they do. And we will go from, from wherever. And they didn't honestly know how to do what they wanted to do because the information from Alaska, which of course at that time was Russian America, was negligible. The maps were kind of non-existent. They didn't even know which way the Yukon River ran. There were debate, there were du duplicate maps saying different things. So because of that, they needed to have much more information. And the only person, only person in the United States that had actually been to Russian America was Robert Kennicott. Um, Kennicott, uh, you've seen here in his um, exploration uniform, um, went for a, on a two or almost three year expedition from the Chicago area through the mid, middle of Canada up to the Yukon and came back when he heard about the Civil War starting. And he had sent over that time period loads of specimens, descriptive letters. He was the only person who knew what it was like to be in Russian America. So Baird, who was always well connected, shall we say, in Washington, knew that the uh, Western Union thing was coming up and that they needed help. So he recommended that, that Kennecott could show up as a consultant because Kennecott knew. All right, so Kennecott shows up and tells the Western Union people, no, you can't go along the coast from San Francisco to Alaska. That's full of rock, you can't do that. And they discuss back and forth and finally decide that they will go from San Francisco. Everybody will gather there. And then they will sail up to um, the Bering Strait and put the line across from there. But in the same time, they have to go from the Bering Strait backward inland to the Yukon, to Fort Yukon, where they can bring the line back down again. All right, this is a massive expedition, massive. So everybody um, in talking about it, when they see what Western Union is planning, Baird's eyes light up, Kennecott's eyes light up, and they say, <laughs> now we can do science. We can find all of these new things, new plants, new animals, new terrain. It will be wonderful for science. And Baird is interested in that particularly because he's um, an officer ahead of the Smithsonian, which was only founded six years earlier. So they are so small, so little, and Baird wants to make it a massive institution. So Kennecott could gather together a bunch of scientists, a group, a group, a group of scientists, all experts in their areas, take them along on this expedition and contribute huge amounts of information to science. And that then is the plan, except Western Union said, no, uh, you can't do that. 
we're, this is business. We're not into science. And Kennecott said, fine, you don't hire them. I'll hire them. I'll split my salary among these scientists and we'll, we'll go. At that point, Western Union said, fine, okay, good. So Kennecott chooses a bunch of people. Listen to me. They are a group of scientists. They know what they're doing. They're not a bunch of people. He finds a group of scientists who are willing to come. They are all known to him personally, except Rothrock. Rothrock um, is a Harvard graduate who studied under Asa Gray and was available to go only because he had been wounded in the Civil War. He volunteered, been uh, injured at um, Fredericksburg and was now limping around using a cane, but feeling better. And so he was available to go along on this expedition. And that was a benefit to Baird as well, because I'm beginning to think that Rothrock was a political appointee. Washington is so full of those that I can't help <laughs> that way. But as I say, the Smithsonian was brand new. It had no reputation. Mm -hmm. Rothrock had a reputation. He was associated with a university that had been going on for a very long time mm -hmm. and with the prime um, teacher at that university. To have someone of Rothrock's status come along on this admittedly kind of catch-as-catch-can sort of group was a real plus. Besides which, um, Rothrock was older than most of the other people, lending a, an air of maturity. To the group. <laughs> so that that served everybody mm -hmm. very well. Asa Gray, mm -hmm. Spencer Fullerton Baird, Rothrock, and Kennecott. Everybody benefited. Okay. Can you tell us more about the men that were on the expedition? <laughs> okay. The other men were all personally known to Kennecott um, and uh, Bannister, er, um, Bannister was a helper of Kennecott. Kennecott from the Chicago area had established a small museum at Northwestern University, which is also new at the time. And so Kennecott and Bannister worked together on that museum. Then Kennecott started a museum in Chicago itself that he wanted to make this, the Smithsonian of the West. And Bannister came along to Chicago to help with whatever was necessary there. Um, then uh, Dahl on the right-hand side here, Dahl also was in Chicago at the time. Um, he was uh, Harvard educated, but he couldn't find a job in the sciences. So his, his mother got him a job in Chicago as a secretarial administrative dog's body. Um, Dahl found Kennecott through the whole uh, Smith scientific groupings, and he worked in the evenings at Kennecott's uh, Chicago Museum, putting the uh, exhibits together and doing whatever else was necessary. Elliot, here on the left, um, was uh, also a friend of Kennecott's in that he had studied with Kennecott at the same time at, as Kennecott at the Smithsonian. So Henry Wood Elliott was um, more of a student of Kennecott's uh, than uh, an equal of Kennecott. And that left Yes, okay, and the next ones were um, and Bischoff, Frederick Bischoff on the left, who also was at the um, Chicago Museum with Kennecott as a taxidermist. He helped to see that everything was stuffed properly and mounted properly. Um, and then Pease on the right was a friend of Kennecott's from childhood. Uh, Charles Pease and Kennecott studied 
briefly together under Pisa's grandfather. So all of these people had known Kennicott in the past, were sort of familiar with him and the way he operated. Um, and Rothrock was the new person in the group. So they all gathered together at the Smithsonian, met one another, found out what the uh, chances were going to be, what conditions they would work together with. And they all got on a boat in New York and sailed to San Francisco. Um, so when they got to San Francisco, everything was kind of at sixes and, and sevens. Um, no, please go back to, okay. um, I don't know. We don't have a picture of San Francisco. Okay, it's all right. Kennecott is fine. Um, when they got to San Francisco, this was, remember, an absolute mm -hmm. huge exhibition. Hundreds of men who were going, who were, had been hired to dig holes, put in telephone poles and string telephone wire. That was their job. But in order to have them do their job, you had to have masses of flour and um, food for the men to eat. Uh, because they were all going to go, at, the original plan was for them all to go up to Alaska. So they were collected on the docks of San Francisco, just huge amount of stuff that had to be taken up to Alaska. But the people in charge in San Francisco said that no proper ship had been arranged for the ones that were available there in San Francisco were not up to doing the job. So as the days ticked by, they got there in April, the days ticked by and nothing was happening. So the people of the Telegraph Expedition said, well, fine, then we will divide the group, all of the men who are going to put up poles and the scientists and half of them will start on land and they will go up the Fraser River and meet up with the Alaska group at Fort Yukon. Well, that was good planning, okay? Uh, it's sort of, you know, uh, making lemonade <laughs> out of what was a very bad situation. So the men are divided and Kennecott's hand-picked scientists were also divided. Rothrock, um, Elliot, and Bannister went with the land group that left um, Kennecott, Pease, and Bischoff to go up to Alaska. So the, the land group left in the middle of May and they went through the, the slides that you had there of the, yeah, can you imagine? I mean, you know, <laughs> they're going on the land, that's not bad, right? Well, yeah, no. Uh, and they had to have these pack mules to take everything they wanted because they were going to set the poles and run the wires all the way from the bottom of Canada through to the top of Canada. These other two pictures, I think, show some of the other, um, yes, these are the poles marching off into the distance. And if you look carefully, you can see the thin wire um, going along the poles. Actually, some of those poles, I'm told, still exist. There is something called the telegraph, telegraph trail that backpackers can take. It's an arduous outdoor kind of thing, but it is an item, it's a thing, the telegraph trail, and you can still take it as far as it goes in Canada. So even that survives from all this time. Um, so the, the overland peel, people, as I say, left in May, and they worked under these kinds of conditions until October. In October, the group was disbanded for 
two sort of reasons. One, it was getting mighty cold the further north they went and the snow is falling and it's difficult working conditions. But also on top of that, in September, the Atlantic Telegraph worked. The line that was sent under the water conveyed messages in September. So whatever Western Union was planning to do after September was now worthless, done. There wasn't any reason. Okay, the, um, they sent, so they sent all the men back, paid them off, the, the expedition was done. Except that Rothrock and Pope, who was, here's on the, on the left, that's Pope as an older man, obviously. <laughs> Rothrock was young, Pope was young. Um, but he was an expert on the telegraph itself and how, what kinds of terrain and conditions you would need to string the wire. So he and Rothrock decided to stay on and do more exploring and more pathfinding. Not entirely sure why they did that. May, may have been that the Western Union thought it was possible. Um, but anyway, that's the last I know of Rothrock and Pope. They went on further, but it was so cold and they were starving. Um, so eventually they said, no, that's it. We're done. We can do no more. Um, Rothrock, in coming back to um, San Francisco, lost all of the specimens that he had collected along the way. And it was really uh, devastating for him to have come back empty handed. The, uh, he was to have taken the Fraser River back, maybe. Um, but whatever, these rivers, when you talk about mountainous, this uh, slide shows the Fraser River in one of its calmer moments. When you get a river like that flowing between mountainous terrain, it isn't flat and serene like that. <laughs> it is rushing. I saw it as a tourist and was jaw dropped because the sound came through, we were on a train and the sound came through the train, you could hear it. You could see the splashing of the water. I couldn't imagine anybody actually coming down that part of the Fraser River. It was like uh, rapids on steroids. And so the fact that he lost his um, specimens coming down any river in the springtime in between in a mountainous area, the miracle they survived. Anyway, um, so Rothrock collected a bunch of stuff and other um, of the um, scientists all collected things. This is a, a specimen envelope that you would find um, it for something that was small and flat, obviously. As a botanist, you get a lot of, which is what Rothrock was. Rothrock was a botanist for the group and he would have a lot of flat leaves and flowers and roots and things. So um, he studied them and labeled them and they ended up at the United States Department of Agriculture, obviously. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that all of the uh, scientists did from this expedition and that and the question is whether or not what Rothrock knew and was able to tell was of benefit to the purchase of Alaska. There are lots of people who said that this whole expedition and the information that they brought back encouraged the United States to buy Alaska. I have never been able to quite um, prove that in anything that I read because what, what America, what the United States wanted to buy was a commercial enterprise. They wanted to exploit the riches of Alaska. So I don't know whether they cared what tree it was, 
They cared how many there were, whether you could cut them down, get them to the port and float them down to some place in America, in the United States. And that's what Sitka was all about. Sitka was the first or last, depending on which way you were, your boat was going, um, port of Alaska. And there were those who wrote back saying that the port of Sitka alone would be worth the purchase because it was this wonderful place that you could ship from. So what Congress really wanted to know was how many acres of trees are there? How many thousands of beaver are there? Can you bring the salmon back fresh enough to be able to sell it in San Francisco or wherever? So it was all about commerce. And that's what caused um, Congress to buy Alaska. Now, did the specimens that the scientists, including Rothrock, help to convey to the public um, how valuable Alaska was? I would like to think so, because actually, in the whole thing <laughs> of Alaska that Rothrock wrote, and the reports that other people brought back um, are what actually is left of the Western Union telegraph expedition to Alaska. Um, and it was the commercial aspects that failed, spectacular economic failure of the expedition, but what lasted was the science and the scientific information that they brought back. There's a certain irony to that, knowing that the scientists <laughs> were add-ons and were not valued by Western Union, but clearly they had a value to the rest of us. So yes, the That's Western excellent. Union expedition. Well. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm going to turn a, a little bit. You have answered all of my questions that we <laughs> asked in the in the previous one. So it's hard for me to ask them because you've did an excellent job answering them. So I know there's something that I've been really dying to ask and that I'm really excited about, well, you sharing. Um, can you tell us about uh, Kennecott's body and why did people think he committed suicide and did he and what did you find? <laughs> well, <laughs> um they, they um, Kennecott had a history of um, depressive behavior. He just got very, very quiet and things um, were not going well. So for a man like that to go up to Alaska twice in the dark of the Alaska winter when they had hours of sunlight, hours of sunlight. So when Kennecott was quiet and they knew that things had not been going well on his aspect of the expedition, they decided, oh, and they knew he took strychnine, that he had strychnine with him. So when he didn't come for breakfast one morning, they went looking for him and found his body on the side of the Yukon River. Um, and they decided that he had swallowed strychnine and died right there on the river. So that was the information that came back first with, uh, with the body. That the body got back at all was absolutely fascinating because you had to take it not only from uh, where he died to the coast, but also back down the coast of North America to San Francisco, then across back across the um, isthmus of Panama over to New York, then from New York by train to Chicago. And um, besides which he had died in um, May of 65, and he got back to uh, Chicago in January of 66. So, I mean, uh, it's crazy. Um, so when they opened the casket in uh, Chicago at his home where he had been buried, 
um, they were hoping to find a calcification of a heart valve that would have caused his death and they couldn't find that. So when I went through the research, it showed that Kennecott had fainted three different times in, in a year. And that faint each time was long enough, strong enough that other people wrote about it. Um, ordinarily, when the heart starts to fail, you get little moments of, of not being present, shall we say. <laughs> but these were big, long faints. So the physicians who finally got a chance to hear the story were able to conclude, even as Kennecott's body was being brought back from Alaska, the doctor on board the ship was able to conclude that he died of organic heart disease, whereas other people had said just heart disease, which was a euphemism for all sorts of otherwise unpleasant methods of dying. So um, organic heart disease, his heart just gave out, that's all. There was no suicide. Um, and that was even true once I got to some of the original documents and could see the drawing of what he had done at, on his, at his death site. He was drawing in the sand, um, picture in the sand of what he was looking at and where the mountains were and where the river was running. Um, and so if he had died of strychnine, there would have been convulsive movements that would have erased the sand drawn picture. So it was um, pretty clear that he did not commit suicide, which is what the family was very pleased to learn that. Yes. Well, we have five minutes left. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Um, I don't know. What did I not tell? You've <laughs> told so much, but there is so much in this story that there is so much in this story. I mean, uh, even from the very first slide that we showed of the uh, Western Union uh, expedition, the there is a man's name there, um, Collins. And Collins was talking about running a line from Siberia to Alaska long before Western Union got into it. So there's a whole story. And uh, the notion of Western Union being so focused on the commercial aspects of things. But that was their job. Their job was not science. Um, it was our luck that Baird was privy to the uh, discussions in in Washington, and that he knew Kennecott to bring in on this. So it was all a, a confluence of other things that you would never have expected to come together, which I just show goes to show you never know. You just never know. Thank you. Sorry about my dog barking. Uh, <laughs> um, but you have done an Excellent job. I really appreciate your time, Sandy. The information you have is amazing. And I cannot wait to get your book and read it and learn even more about the expedition and about Kennecott, because I'm sure there's so much that you I haven't you haven't had time to well, even tell me. Um, it's true. And I love talking about it, as you obviously saw. So the whole thing has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great day.